Awesome. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Uh, like uh, Pavel said, uh, I'm a high performance computing technical consultant based out of Brock University. And uh, today I'm going to be talking about uh, conquering the scheduler, which is hopefully this provocative uh, title, which will get you interested in optimizing your jobs even further for a uh, very large scale uh, throughput. So uh, let's begin uh, with probably the most important point out of anything I'm going to talk about today, and this isn't strictly related to scheduling, but please, 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 please read the wiki, okay? Uh, for your software package, for your language, for your discipline, or anything like that, uh, there are all sorts of uh, tips, tricks, and how to use them on our systems, because they often very much differ from uh, a local system, okay? So here's the wiki. Uh, if you're here, you've probably seen it and you're uh, comfortable with it. Uh, my go-to one that I always use to explain to people uh, that things are different is of course Python. We all pretty much use Python these days, but the way that you actually uh, install packages is different, right? And you're supposed to use this no index. So please always be checking the wiki. If you can't find something, or you're confused about a particular software package, or you want to just ask what's out there for a particular thing, uh, email us at support at computecanada.ca. Typically what will happen, and specifically this week, I'm on ticket response. So I would take your response, kind of try and parse it and hand you off to a, a domain expert or point you in the right direction of that uh, particular topic. If something's missing or you've run into trouble or you're copy pasting things and something goes wrong, let us know. It's an evolving thing. We always want it to be up to date as possible. Okay, so today's outline, the goal is to understand how to get better throughput from the scheduler. Okay, so it's not so much how exactly to use Python or how to use C++ or Fortran to get the absolute most efficient you know, core clock usage per and, and any of these things. Really, it's about working within the confines of the scheduler and what decisions you have to make when about your jobs. Okay, so we're going to start with three kind of what I've identified as the three important definitions, which is core equivalent in the billing. The next would be fair share and partition, uh, fair share and priority. And lastly, partitioning. After that, uh, there's a couple of broad generalizations that we need to conclude before we go further. And that's going to be our assumptions for the talk. And after that, we'll kind of get into the conquering, which is what are some easy, easy things we can do to, you know, without any development time, improve the responsiveness and throughput from the cluster? Uh, we'll talk about the caveats, the final considerations, the things that might not work for you. And then lastly, we'll have our uh, open discussion. Okay, awesome. So the first thing is the uh, core equivalent and billing. This is something you might have seen if you've been interacting with some of Slurm's tools like uh, S Act and SQ, you've seen billing, and maybe you've been uh, curious about what that is. Um, but here's the rationale. If a job specifies an entire node's memory, but only a single core, it has isolated all other jobs from running on that node. Okay, so if you can think about it in uh, nice powers of two, if you have a node that has 128 gigs on it and it has 32 cores on it, if you request one core and 128 gigs, the other 31 cores can no longer be used for work. Okay, so you are charged, which is why we say billing, for the entire node, that entire node's use. Okay, and that's the core equivalent. It is often referred to in Slurm as billing, but it doesn't apply any monetary costs to you, the end user, at, at any point. Okay, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, and the reason for this is one of these uh, standard triangles you can see in the tiny figure over on the right. Uh, we'll get to that a little bit uh, later, Rob, at the end of the talk, we can talk about those exact things. Okay, uh, the reason for, for this core equivalent thing and the billing metric that we've developed is we are trying to be efficient and fair at the cost of responsiveness in general. That's kind of our decision we've made as a federation, okay? And it's one of these classic, there's three things, pick two. Okay, awesome. So it's just some uh, more examples about exactly what the core equivalent looks like so you can follow along with our examples later. Uh, the standard ratio is four gigs of memory to one core. 
And as such, in this particular example, we have one core equivalent because it's all bundled together. It's nice. It's one size together, just like that. Okay. So here are some other examples. On the left, we have, we're using four gigs, but we're using two cores. Okay. So we've isolated away four gigs of memory. In this case, we have two core equivalents. What's interesting is we can have fractional core equivalents, which we see over on the right, where we've used 10 gigs and two cores. So we've used two and a half kind of cores worth of billing, the core equivalents. Okay. This is the metric that Slurm uses when evaluating your actual job sizes. And it's what we also use uh, when we look at your priority and your fair share, which we'll get to in just a moment. Okay, next. Uh, this is one of those uh, things that maybe we talk about later at the end of the talk or if you have questions about. Uh, GPU equivalent, does it exist? Short answer, yes. Long answer, yes. It's definitely well-defined and you can see here by this, this picture, right? If we request two GPUs, but only half of the other systems, uh, memory and cores, we're still build in core equivalents two GPUs. And the reason we're using GPU equivalent instead of CPU equivalent is typically that's normalized to the most stringent resource, the resource that is the least available. So GPUs in this case for the core equivalent, it is the cores, okay? And these are typically uh, computed uh, by taking the percentage of what's available on the node and then norm taking whichever the max of the percentages. So for cores, you're using 50% for memory, 50%. For GPUs, 100%. So it is the 100% of the nodes available resources you are billed in core equivalents. In this case, GPU equivalents. OK, enough about the equivalent. That is exactly what the scheduler sees when evaluating your job shape. Let's talk about fair share and priority. So we have the actual formal definitions on our wiki. And uh, I can link the slides at the end of the talk. Maybe I'll do it now in case you want to be able to follow along. Let me just paste them here. But uh, fair share and priority is, is really what you can expect and how to evaluate uh, the throughput you're going to get from the scheduler. Okay, so your fair share is the slice of the system that your group is entitled to. If you are a default user or an opportunistic user, as we would call it, you are entitled to a smaller share in general than uh, somebody who has a rack award, okay? What's interesting about this is that this fair share can fluctuate based on your recent usage, which is something that we outline here in the uh, job scheduling policies. And it's the fair tree algorithm. There's all these uh, formal definitions for all of what these things mean, but I'll, I'll give you the uh, very simple criteria in just a moment. So priority is a function of a group's fair share combined with job size, okay? So you can think of it as a function that takes fair share and job size and it outputs a priority. So rack accounts typically have a larger priority because they have a larger share of the system they're entitled to. And the kind of important point here that is uh, maybe something that's different from other HPC resources that are out there is time in queue on the uh, federated general purpose systems does not increase your priority very much at all. It is like epsilon small. It's not going to cause you to, uh, you know, jump the queue if your jobs have been waiting in queue uh, a month or anything like that. If you have a very difficult to schedule job and it's been sitting in the queue for a very long time, you should email us. You shouldn't wait for it to uh, like slowly ramp up in priority. That will take months and months. So if there are problems, again, email us. That's the most important thing you can do here. Okay. And so the important point here, and the summary of all of this is the more you have lose, used lately, the less priority you have. It is fairness we are prioritizing here. If you have done, you know, three weeks of work in a day, which is something you can do uh, if the resources are available, you kind of have to pay it forward. But I say pay it forward very carefully. It is not a bank account. Everything is done in terms of a target. You are assumed to be following your fair share, that slice that you are entitled to. And if you have used more than it, you will have to use less later. 
However, there is a half-life decay, which we'll come back, uh, we'll come back to in just a moment. And that is what allows your priority to recover over time. Okay, so all of that is the semi-formal definition of what all of these things mean and it's potentially confusing. The formal definition is here on the wiki. How do I actually look at these values and what can I interpret? Okay, so the command you're looking for is S share. So if you're on the systems, it's this, just like that. And if you wanna view all the different things you can do, it's man S share like this. I've posted in the chat if you wanna copy paste, if you're following along and have a terminal and wanna look at it. But in general, what you would like to say is S share dash L dash capital A, and you want to put your particular account that you're investigating in here, okay? And note that the CPU underscore CPU or underscore GPU suffix is important, okay? So if you're looking, if you wanna see the uh, priority of your CPU jobs and versus your GPU jobs, you have to change that, okay? Because they are completely separate in this case. The most important column here is the one on the far right, which is level FS. Okay, again, wiki for formal definitions, but here is the, uh, the shorthand. If the value is over one, you should see fast responsiveness in general. If you're not, email us. If it's between zero and one and you're seeing a day or a couple of hours, uh, you should wait on it. As the value gets closer and closer and closer to zero, that's signifying that you have used more and more of your fair share and you will have to wait for your priority to recover. If there's an issue with, let's say, you need something to be done on time for a conference deadline, we do support boosting priority, but it is not something we like to do. We like to let the scheduler do its thing on its own, okay? So these are kind of the breakpoints for your own self-diagnosis when you're looking at your level of S. We have a question here. Uh, when sitting in queue, does normal time decay still occur on top of epsilon Q decay, or is it one of the others? So priority, I, I, I'm gonna rephrase the question. There's, there's two things at work here. Your half-life is, con the priority of your jobs in queue is constantly updating, okay? Um, the priority that your jobs are gaining by sitting in queue is very, very small. Okay, so there's, there's two things at work here. Jobs that are in queue are constantly being updated. They can fluctuate wildly based on other usage within the group. And they slowly, slowly, slowly increase when they're sitting in queue. Not enough to be noticeable in general. Okay, let's talk partitioning next. And this is... Uh, probably the most relevant to today's talk. So the general purpose systems contain different resource amounts dedicated to serving particular types of job requests. So this maximizes the responsiveness of the cluster. And so I really like this image over here on the right, which is actually, I think, taken from one of Camille, who is in, in chat here, one of his talks. Without partitioning, we end up with the jar on the left with partitioning and a uh, scheduler that is able to respond to like we're able to customize the partitions, we get the jar on the right. And optimally, of course, you'd like to be in the system that's the jar on the right because the total throughput is higher, okay? On the left side of the slide, we do have a visual representation of the amount of nodes we have in time bins and also whole node versus by core. So just to talk about those really quickly, whole node is when kind of self-explanatory, you get the entire node to yourself. Some of you probably already are doing whole node scheduling, which is great. The other is by core, which is where you're requesting less than a full node, self-explanatory again. But those are the jobs that are like four or five cores in a small memory footprint or, uh, you know, any anything that's not exactly a full node. Okay. And so this is a federation principle is that we are biasing our amount of resources we have available for whole node, shorter duration work. Not short, short duration, but shorter. So you can see uh, in just a moment that the amount of resources that we have in these particular partitions is more or less depending on what we would like researchers to be doing, okay? Awesome, so let's see what this looks like at a glance. And maybe this is going to 
explain some wait times that you've had as a researcher and trying to work with the system. Okay, so we have this layered figure over here on the right, and I'll kind of just let it sink in a bit, but probably the most important and something that we deal with a lot in tickets is look how few large memory nodes there are in comparison to everything else. There is practically none. So ideally, if your jobs and your research need large memory, you should be really, really, really sure that they need large memory. And something users often do is request larger memory, thinking that it's probably fine and it'll run eventually. We're going to get into an example I'm going to talk about shortly, but that might work if you need to run five jobs. But I can't think of a single field where five samples is an acceptable <laughs> replication amount. Okay. So if you need to run a thousand or 10,000 large memory jobs, you need to be really sure that that's the job size that you want. How large is large memory? Great question. In the ratio, uh, I believe it's 16 gigs, will put you into the large memory. So four gigs per core is normal, as we talked about with the core equivalent and what Mark says. Uh, getting into the large memory partitions, I believe, is 16. Mark, that's correct, right? I think it's 12. Yeah, I think it's 12, too. OK, well, it, it's fine. It's, as soon as you go over the ratio of, of 16 to 1, you are in those large memory uh, partitions, OK? But looking at the figure, the most important thing here uh, to also realize is that backfill really, really, really looks awesome, right? Somehow this backfill partition is able to run on any and every node. If possible, it would be great to run in backfill, right? And that's kind of what we're going to talk about in just a moment. But the exact way the backfiller works and how you interact with that uh, is available on the wiki. Uh, is it in the cards for Compute Canada to upgrade to more large memory nodes? Uh, that is a decision that's above my pay grade and uh, should be definitely uh, emailed to support and uh, can be directed to uh, particular site leads. Uh, some systems have more than others, uh, uh, much the same way that some systems have uh, different GPUs and things like that. So that's, that's kind of up to the site. And uh, if you go to the wiki, uh, you are able to see the actual node layouts of each particular system. Uh, Rob says, but some applications actually have a penalty to using a lot of memory. So whole node jobs might result in jobs running slower. Uh, true, true, very true. And this is why it's going to be research dependent, which we'll talk about in just a second. I feel like we're almost at the part where I'm going to get it at the example. Uh, right now, uh, let's just talk the last little bit of partitioning. So how do you view the exact partitions on the system at a glance and what's actively happening in them? OK, so uh, the quickest one at a glance that's just the, the raw numbers is partition stats. And that's going to give you this particular output. I believe this is for Graham. And I think that you might, as a researcher, find this kind of surprising, which is to say, in kind of the bottom left of the table, there are 1,088 whole nodes dedicated or able to run three hour jobs or what we would call B1. Okay, so if you're seeing the partitions, the suffix of a partition is three hours of B1, 12 hours of B2, B3, B4, B5, uh, B6, and, and so on. Okay. All right, and so what is very, very interesting, if we look in the bottom right of the table, the 672 hour bin, large mem whole nodes. There are three. That's it. There are three nodes only dedicated to that. And there are two bicore nodes dedicated to that. Okay, maybe, maybe this is shocking. I'm kind of hoping this is shocking. Okay, you need to be very, very sure that when you're landing in these partitions and you're seeing that your jobs are in queue in those partitions, that that is something that you're very certain about, or else you're going to be waiting quite of a long time. You can see there are, in the top right of the figure, 22 other large mem jobs ahead of you in the 672 hour partition. Not, not necessarily ahead of you. You could be first in line. This doesn't give that. What can tell you approximately what position you are in line is this tool written by Camille called Cluster Stats. 
Uh, the article is a draft, but uh, this should uh, allow you to investigate how many other jobs there are in front of you and kind of more diagnose your wait times, okay? So please investigate this if it's relevant to you and let us know how to improve the documentation or uh, even improve the software, okay? Uh, cluster stats documentation, I will do two things here. I will link my slides, which link directly to cluster stats, and I will also link the wiki page to cluster stats here. Okay, let's talk about some assumptions. And one of them is uh, something that Rob brought up and that we're gonna circle back to, which is um, diminishing returns on things like using lots of memory and these sorts of things, okay? But here, here's our broad general assumptions. Researchers often isolate themselves to very few nodes without noticing, okay? So uh, maybe you're one of the people who submits their jobs with, you know, 128 gigs of memory because that's more than you'll ever need and that's good. But what you're doing is you're really putting yourself uh, in a situation where your wait times uh, are, are going to be much, 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 much higher, okay? The next thing is the easier you make it for Slurm to schedule your job, the sooner it will run, okay? What, what that is to say is the smaller the job shape is, the more applicable it is to different partitions, the more opportunities you have to run, thus the easier it is for Slurm to slot it in somewhere. It's kind of like this game of Tetris, right? The longer you play Tetris, the more little holes there are as, as the board fills up, right? If you can be one of those grains in the sand of, uh, of jar, or you can be one of the small Tetris blocks, there's way more opportunities for you, okay? Next assumption, which isn't really an assumption, it's a fact, is the systems have a lot more bi-node resources than anything else, okay? How can we take advantage of this? Should we take advantage of this? What, like, what does that look like? Talk about that in a second. But this is an important point, uh, the next one here, which is resource waste is bad and should be optimized away. Don't just submit your single core four gig jobs to whole node things and waste an entire node you will be discovered for this. And it is waste, one. And two, the core equivalent is such that you are still being billed for the entire node. So your fair share will decrease accordingly. You may see in that split second for those first couple of jobs that it runs a little sooner. Maybe, can't guarantee it, but it's not worth the cost of, of that waste, okay? And lastly, this is the big one that I'm trying to drive home today is development time is often a cost worth paying to maximize throughput. There are some things that are large development costs and there are some things that are smaller development costs or just coordination costs, which we'll talk about in a second. So let's, let's go on to the actual meat of this and talk about the, uh, the conquering and what conquering what might actually look like. And starting with the low hanging fruit, no development costs. I can't tell you the number of times that we've gotten a ticket that is, hey, the conference deadline is Sunday for my paper. I need to run another hundred jobs. What, like, what do I do? Can you boost the priority? In general, you should submit as much work as you can. The amount of jobs that a user is kind of, or an account is limited to in queue kind of differs between systems, but it's a thousand and it can be manually adjusted. Okay, the more work that you have in queue, the better for your responsiveness. The number of times that I go to check the queue and see it's empty, tell the user to submit all the jobs, a couple hours later, go back and check and see they've all started. That's 99% of the times I'm answering those tickets. Okay, so queue up as much work as possible. Ask for as much as possible in those ways. Okay, the next. Coordinating with others in your lab and group. Accounts do not distinguish between users. They are this group, your lab. So if you are Alice and you have your conference deadline on Sunday, but Bob is working on some small piloting things and his jobs are much easier to schedule than your large production runs, the Slurm schedule will be like, oh, it's this group's turn to run and Bob's jobs will run before yours. 
every single time, especially if they're much easier to schedule. And what happens to that? Your jobs that are in queue, the priority is updated, they go lower, and they may not run. I dealt with that ticket today. That happens a lot too. Okay, so coordinate, talk to the people in your lab, and if they're also running things important, everything's important sometimes in research, uh, to researchers and in research, there's the other systems that you can expand to. And again, tired refrain, I'm a broken record, email us if you're having trouble. Okay, the last one here, the conquering of stage one is uh, probably where the first little bit of, of full work that's not just management of uh, expectations is. Please do not ask for things like GPUs or 20 days of runtime, expecting them to just magically solve all your problems. There are tickets that exist where people ask for GPUs thinking it will make it uh, faster. Unless your software includes accelerator support, uh, you, you are not going to see any speed up and GPUs are highly in demand. You may even just see longer wait times. Asking for an extra 20 days of uh, runtime, let me just hop back to this figure you may have just taken yourself all the way into the 28 day bin with so many fewer nodes. If you need to be there, okay. But if you don't, don't just add 20 days to your, to your jobs runtime, okay? Uh, to, to talk about this a little bit more, oh, Mark's answered the question. It was, if I have a job that uses an edge batch array, so it restarts, does it matter to queue time if I have it set to 10 versus 20? And uh, yeah, Mark's correct. Array jobs are just uh, syntactic sugar, we would say, for uh, submitting the individual array elements. OK, interactive jobs is how, on our systems, you should be profiling uh, your research. So where is this? Interactive jobs. This will give you the ability to hop onto a node, run your work, and see what the performance looks like. If this doesn't work for you, you should contact us, we can help you profile, and we can get those bounds as make sure that you're maximizing the amount of available resources that you're on. Okay? I think we can all agree with that. So that's, that's the low-hanging fruit. Let's go to stage two, but let's talk about a specific example of, of uh, a researcher. This isn't a uh, one researcher in particular, this is a made up researcher who we will uh, feel bad for here in, in just a moment. So their starting job that they're working from on their workstation in their lab is a very, very long running 27 day runtime, six cores, it uses 128 gigs, all of the workstation's memory, and you need to do a thousand submissions or you need to do a thousand runs for your replication, whatever is, uh, the proper word in your field of research. If you submit that without looking at any optimization at all, you are waiting for an entire large memory node to be free for 27 days. There are some other cases of the very, very large memory nodes. We do have some 500 uh, gigabyte nodes, but in, in general, you're waiting a long time and you have to wait a long time, a thousand times. Okay, that's, that's dangerous. So I, I cannot stress this enough. Please optimize your job shapes. Okay, so let's say that you as the researcher go back to the drawing board, you learn a little bit about your software and you arrive at this. You've cut it down completely. You removed some extra uh, file IO. You took advantage of some more parallelism and you cut down the memory footprint. So you're at five days runtime, six cores, 24 gigs of memory, and again, your field, a thousand runs, okay? This is way better. Maybe even for 500 to a thousand runs, you might decide that this is, this is totally fine, that you don't actually need to do any more profiling because the conference publishing cycle is a couple months and you're totally fine with the wait time that this is giving you. But uh, my supervisor personally used to call them angry reviewer number two. There's always an angry reviewer that asks for more runs. So what if they ask for 10,000 runs? All of a sudden you're looking at this job and you're looking at it and you're not looking for a thousand opportunities for your job to run. Now it's 10,000. 
Also, what if you're trying to do other research? What if you're a large lab? How, how does this look at full, full scale? And what can we do to make this, what seemed originally very reasonable, better? And, and why is it bad? Okay. So the reason it's bad is deceptive. It turns out you're in the B4 bin by being at five days. So you're competing with all other jobs in the seven day partitions. Okay, so if you were able to cut that down a little bit to be in B3, you have a much better, wider variety of nodes to run on. Uh, great question. I will come back to that. It is, I'm using code which is not developed by me. How do I estimate memory and time requirements for a run? I would recommend the interactive jobs here and running them and using uh, the good old tried and true run it, run one at a time, find that bound. So you run eight gigs. Okay, it failed. 12 gigs, 16. Okay, it worked at 16. Now tune the runtime. Do this one job at a time. You do not want to submit a thousand jobs at eight gigs and have all a thousand fail. That would be very, very bad, right? You want to iteratively find for your work what work uh, what works best for you. But that is a common case. And interactive jobs can allow you to do that. Uh, interactive jobs are very, very responsive. They should, the sessions should start immediately and let you be uh, interacting right away. Okay, so back to this example. Uh, talking about the core and memory size, sharing the node and finding this shape and duration a thousand times is actually kind of difficult because uh, it's a fifth of a base memory node. Is a fifth a lot? Maybe. Is it, is it too much? Who knows? It depends on what is actively going on on the rest of the cluster. But asking for 10,000 of those spaces to become available is much more difficult than 1,000. OK? And the last most important thing for this is this job is difficult or flat impossible to backfill. You are not able to run on this blue region that we had in this figure originally. Okay, the backfiller will pretty much never look at this job and it will never start at, you know, those Tetris opportunities, those holes. Um, and you will also never be that grain of sand and able to start whenever. Okay, so what do we do with that totally reasonable looking job? What do we do? This is where the development cost and is going to come in and is something that you as the researcher will have to either pay or investigate. Okay. So first one, can we cut up the duration? This is something I think that most researchers should be doing anyway. That, that would be really successful. If you're able to cut the runtime down, that makes your job a lot, a lot easier to schedule. Can we package multiple th of them together into a single node? If you're able to tune kind of the parallelism and have multiple jobs running within the same node, that would be great. We know there's lots of whole node resources, right? That's exactly what we bias in Compute Canada. And lastly, and this is not always possible, is can it be distributed via MPI? Can we be running one core on one node, another core on another, and can we be multiple grains of sand working on the same thing in that job? Okay. I have it in bold here at the, at the bottom. All of this, the best way forward is researcher and software dependent. Some of them, let's say TensorFlow, there is like Python TensorFlow, it, there are answers to this, and we have the answers that are best for our system. If you're writing your own code, you should email us and we can talk about it. This is why we have experts in these particular fields and we can help out. Okay, so let's assume we want to tune for duration. What exactly would that look like? And is the cost benefit uh, worth it for you? So when should we do this? If and only if there is no overhead and start restarting a job. Some workloads, loading everything into memory is really, really expensive. Maybe tuning the duration is not worth it for you. If it's not, if you're doing some sort of differential equation work and it's just, you know, you populate your uh, parameters and it just goes back to chugging away at math and moving them around in like the solution space, it's probably not expensive to restart your job. Okay. So a good way of doing that is, you know, after 10 updates, save your state, or after every hour of execution, save your state. 
This way, what you're able to do is gain access to a huge, huge, huge wide range of nodes to run on, okay? And you have better backfill opportunities. Not the best, but you have better. And then probably the strongest thing about this and why I tell, want to tell researchers and, and everyone here to do this anyway is if any part of the cluster goes down, your progress is saved. Bad things do happen, okay? I'm not, I'm not talking about anything catastrophic. I'm talking about something as simple as maybe the file system experiences a hiccup during a critical part of your execution and the job fails. If that was an hour long job, meh, no big deal. If that was a job that had been running for 27 days and it failed at the bad time and you had waited a week for it to start, you're gonna be angry, okay? So checkpointing is something that you should definitely consider doing anyway and will improve your throughput with the scheduler. Okay, next, uh, here's the resources for tuning for duration. We have a wiki entry on checkpointing briefly. We have specific examples here in the running job sections about restarting for uh, job arrays, which was mentioned in chat. Okay, I'm not gonna go over them individually. We're running a little low on time, but they are there for you to uh, investigate. There's container-based strategies that ex uh, exist. Uh, there's the Berkeley one that exists, is a little bit old, but maybe it's something that can be used. And uh, something that researchers, you, you might be able to do, if it's as simple sometimes as writing to file. Uh, so yeah, implementing your own serialized state is definitely something that's possible as well. And you know those famous packages, the famous software things definitely, definitely uh, have support for these things. Okay, tuning for packaging. I mentioned packaging things together on whole nodes. What was that? What what would that look like? And why would you do it? If you are at a situation where you are certain it's impossible to reduce your job shape down any further, this is what you should consider for the maximum throughput, okay? And if noisy neighbors must be eliminated. We can talk about that later, but sharing resources is not always optimal, you know? Sometimes in, in super, like high performance computing, sharing is not caring, right? You want the whole node to yourself, okay? What do we gain? Access to way, 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 way more nodes, of course, as we showed in the original um, partition stats, and more backfill opportunities because there are more nodes in general. If you combine this with the duration, I don't think you'll have a problem with throughput on the cluster ever again. Okay. Uh, how can you do this? I've got three kind of examples here and kind of what I believe to be uh, maybe the order that you should investigate. So the first one is Glossed. Let me go to my tab here. Glossed allows you to really quickly package a whole bunch of jobs together in one job. So this person here is asking for one node with sbatch. And what they have here is a whole list of the different things. What Glossed will allow you to do is all of these to run separately but together on one node. So you've packaged everything together. Next one is GNU Parallel. Looks a little bit like this, slightly different, harder syntax. And the last one is Meta, okay? So GNU Parallel versus Gloss. GNU Parallel, I like to think that the syntax is a little bit harder, but it has better robust handling of failure in job states. So if your jobs often have uh, wildly different runtimes or, you know, not as uh, predictable memory usage. Maybe GNU Parallel is where you want to start. But lastly, uh, and I'm a fan of this, I'm just starting to look at it now, developed in-house is the meta package, okay? I like to think it combines both of, uh, best of Glossed and GNU Parallel. Syntax is relatively easy. It's managed uh, in-house by uh, a SharkNet representative. So we're able to definitely provide um, support for that. And the wiki page is uh, very, very, very extensive. And there's also a webinar, same format as this one, uh, available for that. And it does lots of other things, okay? Reach out to us if you're curious about any of these things for your research. Lastly, and uh, to make this worth it, I will give a specific number. Um, what if investment is made into something like MPI and cores memory are completely distributed across multiple nodes? So you are now 
running something that's like a single core and 256 megabytes of memory because you're lucky and maybe you're just doing, you're able to abstract your research down to just doing some pure number crunching. Um, we have seen users who are able to do somewhere in the realm of 1400% over saturation of their target. And we're happy about it because otherwise those resources would sit completely idle. They're plugging holes in the system that would be unused otherwise. So we're happy when people are able to get to this level, okay? What's great about this, and the reason they're able to do that is the backfiller will be able to slot them in any and everywhere. You have extreme, extreme throughput gains from this. All of the resources are fair game, okay? And the nice thing about MPI is it's, it's been around for quite some time. There's Python stuff for it. There's C++ stuff for it. There's Fortran stuff for it. Um, the famous software ones will have some sort of MPI support. The only downside is it is much less widely applicable. Okay, like there are situations where it'll just be like, okay, no, this is not possible. Okay, so those are the three things that we can kind of, we can kind of do. We can tune for distribution, we can tune for duration or packaging. Okay, final considerations and complications. This is kind of where I talk about uh, the fact that my advice does not apply to any and every researcher and their situation. There are, of course, corner cases to all of these kind of heuristics and general rules. Um, some things that I should uh, definitely mention, job dependencies are really, really great and something that you should investigate anyway, okay? So if you're in, uh, this is a common thing I've seen in bioinformatics, it's a whole pipeline of five different things. And uh, you end up requesting 128 gigs of RAM and memory RAM. And only the first 10 minutes of the execution uh, uses that much. It would be great and you should put effort into splitting that section out and then using job dependencies uh, and you will see much better performance. Okay, so a job dependency, here's an example. You can say, here, I submit this job. The job ID is 1000. You can submit a second job that says, hey, don't start running until job 1000 has completed successfully. That's what a job dependency is, okay? The meta package can help you manage that and it can manage a, a wider variety of different things as well. Uh, lastly, uh, about GPU things, the by GPU partitions certainly exist. Also certainly beyond the scope of a, a one hour talk about how to combine all of these things with GPUs as well. And GPUs often have even more specialized software. Okay, so a couple different caveats. And again, things are researcher dependent and the cost benefits need to be measured by you individually for your research. Okay, so general principles from today, read the wiki, please read the wiki, please, please read the wiki. Okay, the easier you make it on the scheduler, the sooner your jobs can run. By easier, we mean making things available to more resources or making yourself able to run in backfill and or. Both is great. Okay, isolating yourself to things like high mem or very long duration, it, it hurts and it will cause your wait time to go up. All right, and all of this and fixing these things involves exploiting the structure of the system by either packaging your jobs together to be whole node distributing them via MPI and, and going from there. And those things are worth your development time, okay? Especially if you need a large scale amount of research.